was a feature of, of this week. This panel discussion, diversity and inclusion panel discussion, we've been doing for probably 10 or 12 years. Uh, last year, Barbara and I, my name's Renee Clay, and I'm with Walton Career Services. Barbara and I got together and decided, instead of just doing one day of things to celebrate inclusion and diversity, to have those kinds of conversations, let's do a week's worth of things. So we started that last year. And we're in midweek now. There's some more activities for the rest of this week. So join us for all of those. We have a very distinguished panel with us this afternoon. Uh, and we want the, the discussion to be lively. We want you to take away a lot. Hopefully we'll challenge some of maybe your definitions of diversity and inclusion. Hopefully we can all come to a like mindset before the end of the afternoon. And on behalf of the two of us, we just thank you for being here. Now, Feel free to ask any questions that you think are burning. Uh, there are no limits. Uh, the rule here is what's said here stays here. Um, and, and you're on camera, so we're taping you. Well, we're taping it's it, all though. Good, though. But anyway, we want you to enjoy the session. Hope it's informative. Hope that you learned something. And if you have ideas for future diversity weeks, please drop us a line. Yes, let us know. Right, Leadership you. Walton students, I've been asked to, to address you very quickly and say, please remember to get into Blackboard and, and make sure you, you indicate that you were here in the appropriate place in Blackboard and JR will use the lists from check-in to verify. So Leadership Walton students, make sure you remember to get into Blackboard. And with that, we're, we'd love to start our panel discussion. Thank you all for coming out today. <laughs> so as you mentioned earlier, my name is Eric Mays, and I have the pleasure of introducing our moderator for today. So he is a global leader, consultant, trainer, life coach, motivational speaker, amongst many more. He worked in academia for several years, including here at the University of Arkansas, working with engineering students. He worked as the talent out outreach for Walmart, senior diversity, inclusion, and innovation leader for J.B. Hunt, which is a newly founded position, which he is the first in that role. As if that wasn't enough, and he doesn't sleep, but he also is the founder, CEO, <laughs> this is him, the founder, CEO, <laughs> and senior consultant for Bowtie Leadership and Development, which is a leadership management and professional development firm. Dr. Jenkins is passionate about helping others and lives by the tenets to strive daily not to become a successful man, but to become a man of value. So without further ado, Dr. Todd Jenkins. Wow, that was great. <laughs> Can we give it up for Eric? Thank you so much, buddy. Man, I am so excited to be here. Uh, thank you so much, Eric, for having, uh, for that wonderful introduction. I feel like I should record that. I can take that everywhere I go. Uh, but I am so excited to be with you guys and with our great panelists. Um, and thank you, Walton, um, the Officer of Diversity and Inclusion, as well as Career Services, for having this wonderful event. And I don't think you can go through entire Walton without being epic and not talk about diversity and inclusion. And so with this whole value, so anybody know what epic stands for? E stands for? Excellence. All right. This, this is your values now. I hope you guys know what you're graduating with. Uh, P stands for? Professionalism, these are your values, not, okay. Uh, anybody know what the I stand for? Innovation, C stands for? There we go, somebody's gonna get a degree, I think she already has her. So, uh, but anyway, this is the values that College of Business prides itself on of uh, being epic. And in order to be epic, you must be diverse and you must be inclusive. And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to talk about the importance of diversity and inclusion. Um, and you're going to hear from a lot of great um, panelists that we have from a variety um, of industries. Um, and really, I want to learn from you guys and we want you guys to learn from us. So we want um, you guys to be open 
to a lot of different things we're saying, but we want to hear from you. And so before we get started, and before I let the uh, panelists introduce themselves, I'm going to teach you guys this very, very quick acronym. Of course, I wear bow ties, so I love bow ties. Uh, but it's something that I live by as far as a tenet and a philosophy that I created as an acronym. And this will help you not only in class, but hopefully it can help you with us in this conversation. So the acronym say B. Everyone say B. B. Everyone say B. B. Okay, you got to speak with conviction. Like this <laughs> B, I don't want to be here. Like not that B. B like I want to be here. Okay, B. B. Okay, B stands for be mental, mentally and physically present. Okay, and this is in a conversation. This is here. Be mentally and physically present. So don't get on your cell phones. Okay? I don't think you're mentally present when you're there, unless you're tweeting at us, and I don't think we have a hashtag. So uh, that's B. Everyone say O. O. O is to be open to new ideas. Okay, we're going to say things that may challenge your way of thinking. You may say things, or your neighbor may say things that you'd be like, ah, oh. but it's okay. Just be open. That's all I'm asking you. The next letter say W. W. Say W. W. W, you must be willing to share your own experience. Okay? Own your experience. Own you. Own your ideas, own your thinking, but be willing to share if we call on you, okay? And anybody wear bow ties? Okay? If you wear a bow tie, what is kind of the hardest thing about the bow tie? Yeah, the knot, tying it together. And usually I find in our practice, that is the hardest thing of presentations. That's the hardest thing of conversations. How do you come in, be mentally present, open to new ideas, share your own perspectives, but how do you tie it together? And how do you walk away better than you came? And that's what we want you guys to do um, as we share our thoughts, that you tie it together and that you can actually utilize this practice and what you do in the classroom and also what you do in the workforce. So if that makes sense, say bow tie. Bow tie. If you're with me, say bow tie. Bow tie. Okay, if I have to wake you up, don't, don't let me do that, all right? We're going to have fun. You're going to have fun with me? Right here. Okay, just want to make sure. All right, so I'm going to get out your way. I'm going to have the panelists introduce themselves, tell them uh, a little bit high level why they're here um, and what they bring to the table. So we're going to start with Ms. Holly. Ms. Holly. So Holly Keaton, uh, manager of talent acquisition at Academy Sports and Outdoors. Uh, essentially, I run the university relations program. Um, for academy, intern program, things like that. Um, what I'm looking to get out of today is um, to learn from my fellow panel members um, and to answer any questions you guys have about d &I. I have no, it could be me. Let's see here. There we go. Or you. Go ahead. So thank you, Ms. Holly, for being here. Now we're going to have Mr. Andrew. Close enough, Sandra. Andre, sorry, close, close I, I saw the no W. Call me anything, anything. <laughs> so, so I am the corporate manager of diversity and inclusion for Hormel Foods. Um, basically, I am the diversity and inclusion practitioner leader for the company. Um, so I have responsibilities for our employee resource groups, for all strategy tactics related to diversity and inclusion for the entire organization. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Next, we will have on Andre. our list, Andre. He can call me whatever he wants. Andrew, to Andre. Me. I'm going to get it before the end of this panel. I have been called worse. Don't worry. Oh. <laughs> I'm not going to call you worse. Okay. Uh, Mr. Cook. Oh, hi. I'm, I'm Fred. <laughs> I, I thought you were going to call me Fred or something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, Eugene Cook. I'm a vice president in our application support area. What that really means is that all the applications that run in Walmart stores, DCs, home office, globally, internationally, I support all those com those applications. Um, my hope is just to learn a lot from you as well from the panelists of your thoughts about diversity, how diversity really works in business, and then how do we capitalize in using diversity to drive solutions for our customers. Okay, thank you, Mr. Eugene Cook. Thank you, ne Andre. <laughs> Next, we'll have Emmy or uh, Emmy. 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 Okay, like the there Emmy we go. Awards. <laughs> Emmy, nice. Okay, we'll have Miss Emmy introduce yourself. Hey, thank you. Uh, I am Emmy Cartarelli. I'm the Director of International Sales and Sustainability for Unilever. Can I get a show of hands of a, who knows what Unilever or who Unilever is? Okay, all right, good. You know what we're talking about. A lot of people say, you know what? Um, <laughs> but lots of brands. Uh, really excited to be here. Um, I'm, I'm new to the role, and uh, when I was asked to join the panel, I uh, decided to accept the invitation because what a great opportunity to talk to you guys. 
but also my role uh, in an international capacity requires a lot of diversity of thought and a lot of inclusion, and I want to share a little bit of that um, with you as well. Nice. Can we go around for our wonderful panelists taking the time out to be here? So I'm curious, before we get into level set, what we mean by diversity and inclusion, I just want at least five people to raise their hand and tell us, what are you hoping to get out of this panel? Because we don't have a lot of time. So we, we want to make sure we kind of at least address some of that. So you remember I say, be mentally here, physically present, share your own ideas? OK, let me get five individuals. Yes, sir. Tell us your name and what's your major? Okay, the biggest challenges and opportunities going forward. Yes, ma'am. Miss Mary. Oh, yeah. Um, Mary Ann Bartlett, Information Systems, UFP. And I just want to learn about the impact diversity has within the corporate culture. Okay, impact, challenges, opportunities. Anyone else? Okay. Um, my name is Gabe Galster, and I'm an international finance major. And I would like to know exactly how best you, you fit the, um, the image of trying to make the workplace most diverse when it, with like respect to statistics. Okay, okay. Um, anyone else? One more, one, one or two more brave individuals. Or unless you guys know everything and we can just wrap up and go. <laughs> All right, here we go. Uh, I'm Louis Estrada, international business with a focus on marketing. I guess I'm just wondering how diversity uh, in the workplace can also affect the global marketing aspect when you're reaching towards other people. Okay, so impact in the global globalization. Last one, yes, ma'am. Madison Seven, international business major. I'd like to know the progress that's been made by corporate finance or that diverse employee and how you can help. So how we go about management and recruitment. Okay, great, wonderful, great question. So we'll make sure we try to hit on that. Let's go ahead and start. Um, very high level. I know diversity and inclusion uh, is defined broadly. However, I, I would love for one of the panelists to take a stab at how do we want to level set and define diversity and inclusion uh, for tonight's conversation. Andrew. Oh, why, are, why is everybody looking at me? Because you have diversity in your title. <laughs> All right, so the, the simplest definition that we typically talk about at least at Hormel and some other places that I've worked is, diversity are those things that make you unique and different from everyone else. It's what makes you, you. And inclusion is how you utilize those differences for your benefit and for the benefit of the organization. Okay, did everybody hear that? Uh, Ms. Meyer says a, a great little quote, diversity is getting the invitation to the party, inclusion is allowing you to dance the way you wanna dance, and I even go to the next level. Innovation is allowed for you to make a new song and walk out and everyone jamming. <laughs> you get it? So we, we're, all, we're all set on the same terms, correct? All right, so let's go ahead and go into value proposition. You know, diversity and inclusion, uh, the, the history of diversity came into the corporate space by way of compliance, okay? So it's all about federal regulations, meeting a quota, uh, and meeting different regulations to continue to be in compliance with the law. However, we have moved into this narrative um, and we have seen the proposition um, that diversity and inclusion is good for business. Can you guys talk through why is it good for business? What value do you see of having DNI in the workplace today? So the way that Academy kind of looks at DNI, specifically diversity, really is, is more in a thought process, so diversity of thought. Um, the reason why it's important for our organization to have um, diverse individuals, it's not about the box you check on the survey, right, or your candidate experience, how you fill out your application. Um, it's about bringing your experiences, your background, your culture, the way that you relate to other people to the business, um, to the workplace. Uh, that translates into innovation, that translates into new ideas, new ways of approaching problems, things like that. So um, for us as an organization, we more or less focus on the diversity of thought um, as the, the value add from a diverse standpoint. Okay, anybody else would like to add? For Walmart, it's really about starting with the customer first and having a diverse customer, as you think about all the stores that we have and what we have globally, it's really how do I market to the customer in that particular neighborhood, in that particular area, and that store represents the diversity 
inside of that neighborhood. So that would be really at the retail, at the customer focus. On the IT side that, that I work in, it's really about making sure you have diversity of thought, different ideas, people with um, different ways of uh, working on problems and problem solving. If you think about the world and how the world has gotten so complex, we can't continue to solve the world's problems the way we've always been. It'll take a different group of people, a different mix of thought processes, a different mix of ethnicities to really go solve the world's problems that we got coming up. So that's really the way that we approach it and how we think about it inside of Walmart. Okay, anybody else like that? Yeah, I'll, I'll speak to Unilever a little bit. Unilever is a truly global company with over 400 brands in the US and around the world. And each one of those brands have a certain significance based on the customer base that it targets. Um, you know, we can take uh, laundry detergent, for example. The needs of a certain laundry detergent in one country could be very different than those in another country. Uh, underdeveloped countries could have different ways of using laundry detergent, not a washing machine like we have here. So it does go a little bit to the point Eugene was making on what the customer base looks like and what we're targeting. So that's one big thing that Unilever does on the diversity piece of it. It's the brands and how we target um, our customers and make sure that we're catering to all of our customers. But if you look at the flip side of it, and I'm sitting in your seats the way you're here listening to us today, is what kind of a company do you want to work for? Um, I recently made a change. I spent 13 years at Walmart, and I've been at Unilever for a month. And one of the things I was looking for were different opportunities that catered and fit to my current needs so that I could provide the best of me and bring the best of me to work every day. And one of those things was, um, you know, what's the work-life integration look like? What's the um, dynamic in the workplace look like? What's the gender balance look like? And that's something that I really liked in Unilever. Unilever has a big initiative right now. It just won, uh, it was just awarded one of the top 10 companies for working mothers. I'm a working mom, I've got a 14 month old. Those are some of the things that I was looking for as I was job searching to make sure that it would be a good fit um, for, for my needs. Yeah, One, would like to add? Yeah, uh, so um, for folks like you guys sitting in your seats, and I, I heard from several <laughs> folks in international business, um, diversity is huge from an international standpoint, um, and it's more about not only the diversity of thought, but diversity of cultures, mm -hmm. and how do you integrate these different cultures within the broader culture of the company that you work for, not assimilate it, but kind of ingrain it within there so that the cultures stay true to those particular cultures and the overall culture of the organization stays in. So at Hormel, we're doing a lot more conversations around different cultures. In some of our operations, we, we speak 31, 32 different languages within those plants, we've got folks from around the world within the United States. So how do, how do we allow them to stay true to who they are and bring those wonderful traits that they have from their culture and how do they make our culture better? And so from a DNI perspective, it's about enriching those cultures because one of the things that I have found that's true is you cannot have, cons you cannot have um, sustained interactions between cultures without enriching both cultures, right? You can't have this connection between these differences without both of them taking something away. And my job and the job of our company is how to do that the most efficient way possible. How do I not make you come in and be like me, but we create this bigger, broader, richer tapestry of differences from around the world, not just because of the differences, but for what it, how it allows us to be stronger collectively. Wow, thank you. So you, you, we heard a lot about diversity of thought, diversity of cultures, diversity of languages. How many of you guys in here believe that you bring diversity to the table? Raise your hand. Okay, raise your hand if you feel you don't bring diversity to the table. Okay, good. Okay, so everyone is included in this conversation. And this is why it's important because it is more than a business value. It includes you. So if you really want to be at the table while the corporations are making decisions, you have to show up to work, right? 
And what does that mean, showing up to work? And that's where diversity and inclusion have become imperative because in order for you to really show up to work, you have to be able to have an atmosphere that's in that corporation that allows for you to show up to work. And it's, it's, and it's, a, it's a metric, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a system that's put into place to facilitate that. But if the customers win, if the suppliers win, and then guess what? You win as well because you're being your best self, right? Who don't want to go to work and, and be their best self? Okay, good. Okay, so you see the business proposition. So the question is, um, you look at McKinsey um, Associates, they did a, uh, a research um, and said that gender diverse companies are more likely than 15% to outperform companies that are not gender diverse. Um, companies that have people of color and um, ethnic diversity are 35% more likely to outperform companies that are not ethnically diverse. So my question to my panelists is that we all get it, right? Right? Y'all, I'm talking to y'all. Okay, so I'm gonna have to go back into teaching mode. All right, so if you hear me clap one time, if you hear me clap two times, if you got rhythm, clap three. I, yeah, some of y'all don't have rhythm. Okay, so I need you to wake up because we, are, we all have valuable time and I wanna make sure you learn. And the deal is what I want you to do, we're about to take one minute, listen. And so just go have for your partner to wake up. You need to turn to your neighbor, listen and tell them one thing that you learned because when you share, look, when you share it once, you learn it twice, okay? And I need you guys to learn, okay, while, while we're doing this. So on the count of three, I want you to talk to your neighbor and tell them one thing you learned, okay? One, two, three, go ahead, have the conversation. Hi, neighbor. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what did you learn? I learned it. I, I learned that you didn't. All right, great, 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 great. All right, tell me, tell me. I'm here, I'm here. If you hear me clap one time, if you hear me clap two times, all right, tell me one thing you learned, buddy. Uh, a company that is 50, er, a company that has gender diversity is 15% more likely to succeed. Okay, so more likely to see if they're 15% diverse. Okay, great. All right, tell me one thing you learned. You learned about the bow tie. Okay, that's great, but not good enough. All right, let's go ahead. Tell me what thing you learned. No, I'm okay. It's okay, buddy. Gender's a lot uh, more than just the person. It's more about their ideas and what they can bring to the table. It's more about their ideas and what they can bring to the table. What have you learned, young lady? Mm, that gender or that uh, diversity is more than just being black or white. It's the person and what their ideas are. So it's more about, it's more than color. It's about visible diversity and invisible diversity. Okay, tell me one thing you learned, young man, right here. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, ethnic diversity is 35% more. You're more likely to outperform groups that are not as ethnically diverse. Okay, last one, last but not least. Here. Okay, so you all get it that it works. So I'm going to ask the panelists, why is it a challenge and why are we still talking about this today? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> well, I'll, so I'll give you the Andre answer. I don't know if it's in any books anywhere. And I've been doing this for almost 20 years, so I think I know a little bit about it. The reason is we get it backwards. We've got a lot of companies that are focused on diversity. And a lot of it is, let me bring five from column A, six from column B. I want, you know, I want this because my customers look like whatever. I want, you know, so I, I want the diversity. I want a lot of difference in the workplace. Problem with that is, if your workplace is not ready for it, you got chaos. And so what a lot of companies are finding out is they did a lot of work in bringing a lot of different people into, the, into their organization, but they weren't ready for the diversity that it was brought, brought in. If you're going to bring folks in and you're going to specifically want this diversity for innovation and you want them to share their ideas and you want them to share their cultures and you want the co company to grow, you got to be willing to listen to what those folks say 
you've got to be willing to make those moves that you have asked them to tell you that they need to do. And many companies in many parts of our society aren't ready for that change. Ultimately because in any situation that you have change, somebody loses. Mm -hmm. And so that's why diversity has diversity and inclusion or diversity has such a big deal. And in some places, it's not even diversity and inclusion. It's just diversity. Oh yeah, that inclusion piece is in there. We're gonna take care of it. You gotta take care of that first. You gotta take care of that. You've gotta create the environment within the organization in which diversity can flourish before you can ask for a whole lot of people to come in. Because at the end of the day, diversity is reality. Um, if you looked, probably very, none of you people were around in 1970. 1970, the United States was 80 plus, 83 percent white. 83 percent. It's probably somewhere around 62 percent now. By 2043, it'll be somewhere in the 40s. You'll be looking at the first time in history that the United States will be a majority minority country. We don't know what that's going to do to business. We don't know what that's going to do to society. All we know is it's going to be a tremendous change and things will be different. And companies who will survive will be in a position to do something 25 years from now that we've never had to do. That is, we have to listen to a lot of different voices from a lot of different perspectives and look at things very differently. And if you don't have a culture that can do that, then you're going to lose. My take is that it's um, bigger than an initiative. It has to be personal. So I'll tell you really about my personal story, and then I want to hear from you on how you adapt it. Um, it's simple stuff. It's like when you go to lunch, you're always eating with the same people. When you're sitting down, you sit with the same group. You have the same group of friends. So one of the things that I had an opportunity to do, some guys asked me to go hunting with them. And I was like, OK, honey. They was like, yeah, like in the woods. And I was like, OK, like I'm from Atlanta, concrete, cement, no woods. They was like, hey, we, we want you to go. And they asked me, like every year they go on this hunting trip, and I said no. So finally one year I said, hey, I'm going to go. So obviously, I had to go out and get all this hunting stuff because I wanted to make it look like I was a serious hunter. Got my face all mixed up, got all these things, and I actually you know, went out there with him. So I'm sitting up there, and I'm sitting in this tree, and I'm waiting for a deer to come by. Like We've been sitting there for like two hours, and I'm like, how long are we going to have to sit here? And they was like, hey, just be worried about it. I said, no, let me run over here and run them over here, and then y'all can, can just shoot them. So you were the dog. Yeah. <laughs> but, I, I ended up going out there. We didn't stay out. I stayed out there for maybe like four or five hours, and then I came back to work. The difference that it made with those individuals, they saw that I was able to get out of my comfort zone and do something different with them. And it opened up a different relationship that we've had, I think, I've been working at Walmart for 20 years, over the last 15 years. It was a hunting trip for three hours that now gave me relationships that last for a lifetime. It opened up to my mind to understand, like, you know, because I always used to think, like, hey, I'm African American, I'm pretty diverse, I, I'm good. Like, there's nothing <laughs> I need to learn about this. But what I started to understand as you go through problems and as you begin to work with things, diversity is bigger than the, the color piece. It's bigger than, you know, as the problems are coming, it's how you think about things. It's your own intentional way of thinking. Sometimes when someone comes to talk to you, you always say, oh, this person's coming to talk to me, I already know the answer. You know, I always know it's the same problem they already have. But if you don't listen, if you don't open your mind up, you won't begin to experience what diversity is all about. So the challenge that I have for you as you sit in this room, think about your friends. Think about you. It's not wait till I get to this company to experience diversity. It's not wait till I get my job to experience mm -hmm. diversity. How am I being experiencing diversity on this campus on an everyday basis? You walk by people every single day where you can experience in this and it can open your mind totally different to those things. So every single month I challenge you to do something different. Think outside the box and go do something that's going to open your mind to diversity. That's wonderful. That's what, you want to ask something, Solly? Yeah, I was just going to say, from a talent acquisition standpoint, from a recruiting standpoint, people, how many of you get excited when you're out on vacation and you meet another Razorback? 
you get excited, right? They're like you. They're similar to you. I think organizations are um, long-standing organizations, right? Something we would consider old-school organizations. From a talent acquisition standpoint, people hire people like them. As, as an organization, if we don't educate internally first why diversity is important and why it will help us thrive as a business, we won't be able to bring the right people in the door. Um, because the, the hiring managers, the leaders of the organization are going to hire people who went to their school, who had the same major as them, who worked in a previous life like them at a, at a certain company, right? Um, so that diversity initiative, that inclusion initiative has to start from the inside out. You can't just go in, like Andre was talking about, and get the numbers, check the boxes mm -hmm. uh, from a recruiting standpoint. Um, so I think that that, a lot of, a lot of indus industries are challenged in that space um, that they haven't educated their entire workforce on why diversity and inclusion is important. Really good point. You have a question, Mary? What's up? Well, when, when you say that, do I have problems? Do I have an issue? No. <laughs> no, that's, that's a good question. I'll, I'll tackle that and weave that into to a little um, experience I went through today, actually. Um, not so much diversity and ethics, but it's the need to be inclusive of what you're hearing in conversations that go on around the world and be empathetic to the culture that that particular customer or country or business partner is living. Mm -hmm. So a day in my life. Just today. Um, <laughs> and, and also the importance of weaving diversity, inclusion, work-life integration, um, and how necessary that is. You know, I wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning with a 15-month-old um, crying and trying to get him ready while I'm getting myself ready for work while I'm running upstairs trying to turn the computer on because I've got a call with India. So I'm trying to, to switch, you know, change channels really quickly from mom to call with India. And, um, you know, the reality is you're talking with someone in another country here, as it's become a melting pot, we all to some extent understand what each other's saying. Well, I have to focus a little bit more to ensure that nothing gets lost in translation because there is that difference in accent that I'm dealing with. So change channels, I'm talking to India, I take all my notes, um, wrap that up, hop in car, drop baby at daycare, go to work and get on a call with Brazil. Okay, there's another language barrier to deal with because I hablo español, pero no portoñol, you know, I don't <laughs> speak the mix of Portuguese and sí. Spanish. I can understand a little bit, but so there's another channel I have to flip into. Um, then from Brazil, I go to, you know, having a full conversation on which brands can we take around the world and why, and which brands that are existing around the world can we bring to the U.S. and why. So you've got all these different mindsets on a phone, and you're trying to figure out who's talking to who, so you really have to be um, intentional on what you're hearing. Then... Um, I translate into, or I skip over, you know, skip lunch, then I'm you know, taking all my notes and trying to figure out how I'm going to include, being inclusive, everyone's thoughts and a strategy that I have to put together to present on how I'm going to move forward. Then um, best part of the day is I get to come down here and talk to you guys and absorb a lot of other valuable information. But my day doesn't end when I leave here. I go home and I have another call with Japan at 7 o'clock tonight, and then I'm going to have to figure out how I'm going to understand what they're saying because some people's English is a lot more challenged than others. Mm -hmm. And no, I don't have the little translator and the little ribbon <laughs> on the bottom of my computer <laughs> screen, <laughs> the sub-captioning. But um, it, it's really going into all of these conversations on a true day-to-day -day life and meetings that I have, being open to what they're going to say. Some of the things they propose may not be ethical here in the U.S. or ethical in other countries. And, you know, we have to figure out how, how to work around those, those nuances, but that's one of the, the main reasons that, you know, this inclusion piece, you know, diversity, I, I, I do want to move a little bit away from the diversity because diversity, I think, as, mm -hmm. as Andre and Eugene and Holly have said, I think the companies have diversity down. Mm -hmm. It's how are we inclusive and how do we embrace the thoughts of the diversity that's brought in and how do we include that in the day-to-day -day, um, business needs that exist with the companies that we work for. The only thing I'd add, and maybe you and Andre can speak to this, um, people are scared about it. Very scared. I mean, <laughs> when, you have a, when you have a topic that people are afraid, it's almost like race, but um, people will 
say something about diversity, they'll make a small joke about it. And I think people are really afraid to either be for it or against it. Um, they're afraid to have an opinion on it or not have an opinion on it. And I have friends that feel like sometimes this is just being stuffed down their throats. And, and I think in order to have the dialogue, you gotta have the relationship, you gotta have the transparency, you gotta have the honesty where you can talk about it and everybody's ideas are viewed and they're all viewed the same. And I think what people need to understand about each company, and, and you talk to me about this a lot, there's no one way diversity is gonna be solved. Right. How we do it at Unilever, how we do it at you know, Academy, how we do it at Hormel, it's completely different. There's not one thing that each company just roll out and say, hey, here's our plan. Now there's things that are similar, there's mm -hmm. things you can do from a recruiting basis, but diversity will be solved inside of the company and by people that's sitting out right here. And I think once you get people talking about it and not being afraid to have the discussion and just open to it and know that it includes you too. Because I think a lot of times people get caught up on the race side and say, well, hey, they don't, they're not talking about me. To Ty's point, it's everybody. And I would say, to, good, good point. And, I, and like I said, I do want this to be a great takeaway. Uh, we know diversity and inclusion is important, but what I have seen in research, I've seen in practice, that is the piece that is missing. A lot of individuals, managers, new millennials, whoever, they don't know how to have the conversation about it. You don't know where to start. You know, you look at research, a lot of the, a lot of the research will show like, you say, hey, do you, are you nervous to talk about diversity? Most people were like, no, I'm not nervous in my house. But then I asked them, are you nervous to talk about diversity with your neighbor? And then they say, well, my neighbor don't even know how to talk about diversity like I know how to talk about diversity. <laughs> That, that's what everyone believes, you know? And if we can get outside of that, you know, what's happening at the dinner table, uh, what, you know, even the conversation we have with our parents, our grandparents, what are we having with our friends? Um, our generation of millennials are feeling like diversity is not an issue, right? You know, we don't see color, you know, everyone is just welcome to the party, you do well, good morals, and we're gonna be great to kingdom come. Like that's how, you know, <laughs> march on. Uh, however, you see that now in the college groups, but you also see that people start, you know, separating based on common entrance, whether that's to be a student organization, sometimes it's by race, not naturally, like naturally it's happening, but people gravitate towards common interests. So let's flip that into the workplace. Now you're in a corporation, okay? And if you have a common interest to the point of Razorback, okay? I love the Razorback, but if I'm looking at a panel of Three now, we already know we're gonna, this is what we call unconscious bias, <laughs> but we have a bias, there's biases in who we may pick and recruit based on interests, right? So if I, if this young man had, if Lewis had a, a bow tie on, I may go up to Lewis and be like, hey Lewis, and I may even skip over Hannah because I have a, a immediate interest with Lewis, right? Okay, what does that mean, Todd? Thank you for asking. If you are a, if you are a recruit, and you have a recruit with a bow tie, and I love bow tie, even though you may not be that great, but because I have gotten to know you a lot more because of the bow tie that you wear, I may select you. Is that right? No. Is that wrong? I'm not here to say that. But what I am here to say is that you must be aware of what you bring to the table and how does that play into the workplace environment. And that's where unconscious bias play in, and that's what we're doing a lot in corporate space of how we make everyone aware uh, you know, where, where do we want to go um, as, a, as a corporation? Where does our, when it comes to ethics, how does it relate to your mission? How does it relate to the values of the organization? And how does it relate to the business case? Okay? okay. You had a question? No? You want to say, you want to follow up, Mary? Okay. So with that, how do you bring up these topics within the organization? Like, is there like seminars that everyone participates in to make sure like this type of I can answer so, that, but I throw it to you. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> so what we do is we try and teach, we try and teach a life skill that will apply to a lot of different questions and not necessarily focus it on DNI. And what we try and get across is how empathetic can you be individual to individual. Um, and the important part of that empathy conversation is 
how well do I first understand your argument before I start telling you my response? I'll give you, I'll give you a good example. Well, I'm a little nervous about this, one, but I'll give you this example. <laughs> this, this, this happened to me. Um, so I have a, a colleague who I have developed a wonderful relationship with. And he feels very comfortable with bringing up interesting topics to me. So he comes into my office one day and makes the statement that as bad as it was, slavery was a good deal for, for me. So a pretty bold statement, pretty bold statement to tell me slavery was a good deal. Um, my first reaction was to punch him in the face and <laughs> kick him out of the office. My second reaction was, I got to figure out where this came from. And so, tell me more. And so, I'm really trying now to figure out what he's trying to say. It turned out he was coming from a very religious background, deeply held beliefs, and it was all part of God's plan for people to get here. And at the end of the day, the, the descendants of slaves were in a better place than they would have been if they had stayed on the African continent. Very well thought out, very, very, very strongly delivered. He was very, very um, committed to his position. I disagreed with him with every fiber of my body, um, but I now knew where he was coming from. So this wasn't a random act of being stupid. This was basically going, I've got an idea here that I think might make some sense. What do you think about it? And so we had a wonderful um, conversation where he was talking about, you know, look at where you are now, where you would have been if, and I go, yeah, but you forget about you depopulated an entire continent, and that if I'm any good, would I also be good even if I was on that particular continent? So there's a lot of stuff that he left out in his, in his argument that I brought to his attention, um, but we had a civil conversation about what most people would have deemed a very touchy subject. But the key to that is, one, being open, as, as Eugene said, being open to hear what the other perspective was before I immediately attacked what the position was. And so we try and teach that empathetic, listening type of skills, not necessarily will I agree with your position, but I want to understand it so that I can understand where you're coming from. So I knew where he was coming from. I knew it was a religious argument. I knew it was deeply held. Um, we've had many since then. And he can now feel very comfortable bringing those situations to me. I don't know how many things we have headed off because he represents a certain segment of the workforce. And if I can develop a message that will resonate with him, I've now resonated with a large portion of our workforce. And that makes us all better. They learn, I learn. That's kind of how we get to how do we handle those questions. So it's not necessarily a DNI. It's here's a life skill that everybody should learn so that we can all be better. Good point. I, I, and I, just to piggyback off that, uh, did you want to speak, Ms. Lolly? OK. To piggyback off that is that how you bring it up in the workplace, right? You know, you're new. You know, you already think you're about to be CEO next week. That's how millennials think. Uh, but, you know, you take your time and you, have, you understand the culture, right? Just like U of A, everyone came here. You probably heard about the culture from your brothers or people from your hometown, but you had to come to the U of A and really understand the culture, understand that you can wear big shirts and it look like gowns or something, I don't know. Um, or understand that it's okay if you don't wear big shirts. It's okay if you don't go hunting. You know, it's, it's a lot of different stereotypes that comes into a culture before you even get there. But once you got here now, now you're here, some of them may be true, but most of them may not be true, right? Like you have to go to college and you have to go to class. That's very true to make it through, right? And so you understand that, and that's how the workplace works. You have to go in and understand the culture, and once you understand the culture and you really work with your supervisor, you can ask questions. But I'm gonna give you guys another tip um, that you can learn as well. Um, it, it's something called ERGs or BRGs. Anybody know what that stands for? Great, I said I knew you was gonna learn something. All right, so ERGs stands for Employee Resource Groups 
or business uh, resource groups. And these are groups that's usually for underrepresented um, populations of a workplace that they all come together. Um, not, it's not just for those individuals. Anyone can join, but it's for common interest. So they have you know, different groups such as women or Latino or um, pride, um, religious minority. I've seen, a, I've seen a lot of different common interest groups that's not represented. You can go to those groups to learn how to be an ally or learn how to advocate for them. Another thing is you guys are the leaders, right? You're coming in and you're gonna be, on, you're gonna be a project manager, you're gonna be a supply chain leader, and now it's time for you to come in with inclusive lenses to ask those questions. Oh, what about the women? Or, you know, I see we keep marketing towards this. What about multicultural marketing? So you guys are coming to the workforce to kind of challenge that to make the business better because you want to add value. And any, you don't have to be a DNI professional to add value and to be inclusive of all talents, right? So I would like to ask the panelists, uh, what, what do you feel uh, that students can do now? Because everybody want to know what can I do now to be you know, the best applicant when it comes to recruiting um, from a diversity and inclusive space. So I heard from Eugene earlier say, get, you know, get new friends. You know, uh, you can meet different people, but is there anything in the classroom that they can be doing, or what advice do you have for them? So I'll, I'll say one of the things, Renee has heard me say it several times when I've come to talk in the past, but do your research on the company you want to work for. Research and understand what their culture is like. Make sure that it's a culture that you want to be a part of. Every country has, every country, every company has a different, every country does too, but every company has a different corporate culture and you really want to find the one that your beliefs align with the most so that you can succeed the most. Um, as I was, you know, looking to make my change, I was, you know, part of a company that's got a very strong corporate culture, Walmart, and when it was time for me to start looking for, for something else for the next step in my career, I wanted to find a company that matched up with with my beliefs, and that's what I started to look for. But it, it went beyond just the, okay, let me look on the website and see what the company's about. Do your research, learn what the company's about, talk to people that work for that company, see what they think about the company. Are they happy, or are they not happy? Are they taking their full selves to work, or are they just showing up to get a paycheck? Mm -hmm. You know, some of those questions can really tell you what a company is about and what the culture is about at that company. And the better aligned you are with that company, the more you're going to excel in that company, the easier it's going to be to, um, to be inclusive and to be included in the environment that that company portrays. Good point. So do your research. Everyone say, do your research. <laughs> Please. <laughs> say, do your research. Do your research. Okay. Go ahead, Miss Holly. I think something that you guys can do now, um, something I heard at one of our leaders say about a month ago in a, in a talk was, um, step out of your comfort zone. If you feel uncomfortable doing something, it's probably worth it. Um, I spoke, I was in interviews all day, and I'll do interviews all day tomorrow, and I spoke to a young lady. I actually think she's in the room right now. Um, I spoke to a young lady today that talked about her opportunity to go abroad, and she wanted to go to a country that she was super familiar with and really excited about, and she had a professor challenge her and say, is that really what you want to do? Does it make you feel uncomfortable? You're going to go lay on a beach all day and speak to a bunch of English speakers and you're going to enjoy your vacation. Why don't you go to a country that's not English focused, that you're going to meet all new people and you're going to be challenged and feel really uncomfortable? And she said she went home that night and thought about it and said, yeah, probably should step out of my comfort zone. And she said that that lesson for her was to step out of her comfort zone often. It's the way that you experience new things, new people, things like that. That those kinds of experiences coming to the workplace with those types of things are invaluable. From a talent acquisition standpoint, I love hearing things like that. Um, so that's something that you guys can do now and the jobs that you choose to take, the internships that you guys choose to join over the summer, the study abroad programs, the classes that you take, the professors that you connect with, um, do something that's different. And, this, and also going on, guys, you right now in college, this is the time to really embrace and explore. Because when you get in a young professional, you're like, I gotta go to work, I gotta do this. And you just lose creativity sometimes because it's like, you, can, you really have a lot of opportunities here. It's a lot of student organizations. I will challenge you, you know, before the end of May, you know, go to another student organization that you feel like I'm very uncomfortable with and know what they're talking about. 
I guarantee it's, it's easy for you to do it now versus when you get out into the workforce. You may even forget about the whole thing we talked about. But if you do it now, it can really add to your value when you're talking about a challenging time in your interview. Mm -hmm. And I guarantee you, companies are looking for you to be able to adapt, to be able to bring your whole self. Now you're a lot more confident what you do bring to the table. And you can listen to a different radio ch channel. I mean, it's all type, you know, podcasts. You don't even have to go out, even though I think you should go interact with people, because I really think you should do that. But sometimes, sometimes, you know, you guys can also you just bring it into your forefront, watch different YouTubes, listen, you know, when nobody's, you know, listening to you, listen to, you know, whatever you feel uncomfortable with, at least you can engage in that way. So I basically tell everyone, it's no excuse today for you not to be able to jump out of your comfort zone. Uh, and the time to do it is now. And the time is to do it is now. And it helps. And you don't have to even conform to your group. You know, I always tell a lot of my students, when you graduate and you don't get that job, do you think all your classmates say, you know what, I'm not going to take my job because you didn't get a job. No, they're going to be like, I see you. <laughs> see you later. I, I will see you in Texas or whatever. No. So right now, you have to take advantage of your education outside the classroom and inside the classroom. You know, ask, ask the inter you can interview the employer, too. It's not about just the employer interviewing you. You can interview them. What is your competencies around diversity and inclusion? What is your position statement on diversity and inclusion? I'm, sometimes I guarantee some probably never asked them that. And they probably go, D -d -d -d. now you can say, well, this is what I believe. So you're adding value to the table. A lot of people are born originals, and they die copies. You can be original. You can be original. A lot of people come into the workplace, and they are a me two, a me three, and a me four. You can, you can, say, you can, you can bring innovation ideas to the table. So these, this is what we're looking for, and this is why we have hope for the future, because everyone in this room is going to be impressive. So Holly can take back and say, I have so many offers. I, I don't even know who I can, you know, I don't even know if we can hold them all in, in the head count. So, uh, what other advice do you have, so, parting advice? So the thing that I would add is really about three E's, education. You're getting an education today. You can't say, I don't know no more, I don't, I don't understand. You're getting an education today. There's a lot of people that work here that can provide that education from the Office of Diversity here. The second thing is about exposure. You got exposure today. The other challenge is go out, get yourself exposure on other things that's going on campus. The things that you see going on, how do you get involved, what you see on TV, how do you get a different, a different perspective on what you're seeing. The last thing that will be, the E will be experience. The experience that you will learn, that you can carry forth from this university into the companies, you'll be so far ahead of the game. Um, it can get tricky sometimes, it can get scary. You can feel like, you know, I feel like, you know, sometimes I go someplace, and you know, first thing you think about, like, a person will say, hey, you know, you're like the only black person in here. <laughs> I said, everybody's going to remember me then. Hey, what's going on? Don't be afraid of being the only one or being the first or being different. Mm -hmm. um, be yourself. Be unique. The companies will hire people that's unique. And when they're looking at resumes, when they're looking at talking to you, when they're looking at the conversations that they have, they're looking for what is going to stand out about you. The diversity piece would be huge. You ask somebody a diversity question, I'll tell you recruiters, they're going to be like, OK. They're going to be like, yep, I, whoop, <laughs> got come it. on in. Now, don't everybody go there, ask a diversity question tomorrow to Holly, but <laughs> I think it'll put you on a different level of how, really <laughs> of how you're thinking. So mm -hmm. like I said, those three E's, and, and, and just concentrate on those. And you won't always get it right. You'll make some mistakes. You'll do some things. Like, I went from having a um, direct reports, a group of guys, it was mostly guys, and I could always say, you guys. <laughs> Last week, I moved to a different department, it's all ladies. So now when I'm still talking to them, I'll say, you got, oh, I can't say that. And <laughs> one of the things that I've taught myself, and they was like, no, it's okay, it's cool. And I said, no, it's disrespectful, because you're ladies. And I said, from now on, every time I say it, I'll donate $5 to go to the Children's Miracle Network. Yesterday, $15 in there, bam, bam, bam. <laughs> but it's something, but that's something simplistic that I told them how I want to respect them, how I want to honor them, how I want to have conversations with, it's changed the way we even have our relationship. Okay, closing thoughts? 
Um, I think the only thing that I would 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 say, and it's it's not necessarily under the DNI umbrella, but I would say the one skill that you could um, master that will help you almost regardless of what career you go after is to be better critical thinkers. Um, you know, to the, to the point earlier, there are a lot of copies out there. There are not a lot of people who will see a situation and analyze it critically and then be able to do something with that information. So I would say if you can, you know, don't take whatever you see or you get at face value, look at it critically. Ask why is it this way? Get to the root cause of situations. If you are a really good critical thinker, you will be of great value to any organization that you join. Hmm. And so if there was one skill, I would say master while you're here and practice while it's safe to be able to do it, it would be critical thinking. What, did you guys learn something tonight? Yes. Okay, I want to make sure, I know, I know it's late, but I just want to make sure you guys learned something tonight. Was this good? Was this valuable? Okay, can you give a round of applause for them? So it was a several things that we, you know, with partner thoughts, it was several things we talked about. First, first and foremost, as we all understand, it's more than diversity, right? It's about inclusion, it's about innovation. It's more than visible diversity as well. Now, don't forget that, that's still a part of the narrative, but it's also about invisible diversity and diversity of thought and what you bring to the table. Also, another thing is be yourself. Bring all you can be best in class that's best for that business. And it's okay for you to ask the question to the employer, what are they doing in diversity and inclusion space? Okay, this is, I'm telling you, you should put this on every, Anytime you talk to an employer, ask them that question because you don't want to jump into a culture and you're like, wow, I'm, I'm navigating all of these hidden rules and these hidden cultures. So that's the other thing. Um, expand our hearts and minds. Be open. Start the conversation now. College is more, you know, it's, it's here to help you practice. It's here to help you experience these things so you can be ready for the workforce. Um, next thing is don't lose your curiosity. I see so many people come into the workplace and they just sit down and wait for someone to tell them everything to do. Be curious, you know, think critically, be creative, because that's what, what will change the workplace of tomorrow. The last thing, we didn't touch on this, but this is very important. Find a mentor. You need a mentor, you, everyone needs a mentor. I, I, when I was in um, engineering, I used to ask all my students, who's your mentor? Every time they answer, 95%. My mom, my dad. I'm not saying that's nothing wrong, but mommy and daddy is gonna always tell you some good things you wanna hear. I'm sorry, but you need a mentor. You need a mentor, someone who's gonna talk with you, okay? You have sponsorship, so that's someone who's gonna talk for you. Then you have a coach, someone who's gonna talk at you. But you need a mentor, one who looked like you and one who does not. Why? It brings diverse experience. It helps you with inclusion of thought. And inclusive of a thought, and it can really prepare you for the workplace. So I hope you guys have. Can I add something to that? Yeah, please. So I'm, it, I, I piggyback off that. I think it's very important, especially at the beginning of your career. But I would say look at it as a mentoring network. Mm -hmm. And that network should include um, people that are doing those three things. You need a sponsor. You need a coach. You need a mentor. Many times, we, you may go to work for an organization that will say, I'll get you a mentor. Well, no mentor is good at everything that you're going to potentially need or can help you in all situations. So I look at it as a network and find those people to be within that network that can help you move where you need to be. You're going to need coaches. You're going to need people that are good at things that you're not good at. You're going to need mentors. You're going to need people that you trust enough so that they can tell you those messages that you don't want to hear. And you're going to need that sponsor. You're going to need someone higher up in the organization that sees you and sees the talent that you have and is willing to talk to their peers um, on your behalf to move you through the organization. 
Um, and many times, if you're a woman or a person of color, you don't get that um, across businesses. You don't get that mentoring network. You don't get that sponsorship. You don't get that mentor that will tell you those things that you don't need to hear and you need to have. Um, and so the one thing that I would tell you is as you start out on your careers, as you're looking at it, don't think in terms of a mentor, think in terms of a mentoring network. Thank you. And I will tell you guys as we conclude is I know several of these individuals wouldn't mind if you reach out to them for a mentoring network. I'm just putting them on the spot. Um, I know we wasn't able to, we're at time, we wasn't able to get more questions, but we're very happy to answer questions. I give out my email, todd.jenkins at jbhunt.com. Feel free to, you know, uh, reach out to me at any time. I also want to say thank you for being here, even if you are coming here for credit. <laughs> but thank you for being here, because it's individuals like you. You have to believe that you are epic. You have to really believe that you can bring an inclusive workforce. And if you don't believe in yourself, you can't expect for no one else to do that. So thank you guys for being here. Thank you, Walton. Thank you, College of Business, Dr. Lofton, um, and Career Services for having this. This shows that our future is bright. And I hope you guys have learned. And I'm going to turn it over to Meredith. Thank you guys so much.